legislated or voluntary, they continue to be the most effective means for increasing the number of women both in political parties and in elective office. As you all know, but I'm just going to review quickly, there are several types of quota systems. One is a quota for candidates. This is a system of reserved seats, such as those in Rwanda, Uganda, or Morocco, that guarantees that women candidates will be elected and achieve a specific level of representation in targeted political institutions, such as parliament. There have also been comparable attempts in Canada, Australia, and the UK to get women candidates designated within quotas to winnable constituencies. And there's also a quota that targets party lists, such as in Mexico. It does not guarantee the election of women candidates, but it depends on the placement of women candidates, the percentage of the votes her party receives, and that sort of thing. There's also been talk of quotas for the representative institution in multiple levels of government. So whether it's the national legislature, locally elected bodies, the executive branch with cabinet appointments, but also the judiciary and leadership within political parties as well. And finally, there are the internal party quotas for candidates and for governing boards. So a number of parties around the world have internal quotas where they voluntarily make sure one out of three or even 50% are in leadership in their parties and as well as on the candidate list. So 50 countries around the world have legislated candidate quotas for women, and there are voluntary party quotas in over 30 countries. So quotas are no longer a new idea. They're, they are being implemented around the world in different ways, and in actually the majority of countries now. So although we at NDI understand that simply passing a quota law is certainly not enough to ensure women's political participation and leadership, this conversation will focus on that aspect of it. How are the lessons learned for developing and passing an effective quota law and ensuring that quota laws are carried out and implemented? And then we can have whole other discussions about what happens after that quota law is passed and implemented with political parties and other things. NDI programs often involve quota laws, whether we're working with civil society in the design and promotion of the laws, or working with political parties and women who seek to run for political office. Often, political working with quotas isn't a direct part of our programming, but it, it obviously affects the political programming that we're doing. So that even though we're not focused specifically on it, it will impact both the programming we do and how it will be um, impact in that country. So we thought it was important to bring together some recent country program examples that highlight the lessons learned regard to, to the quota implementation and passing. And these countries uh, represent a very wide range of examples, and I think we'll give you the nuances of the uh, quota laws and that they're not all the same. So let's start with Kenya today. It's a very recent example. Uh, we talk, we've been talking a lot about the Kenya elections here at NDI, and it's also because it's at the beginning of its journey to implementation. Um, and Alison Paul Schreiber from the SDA team will give us a description. Sure. I've just got a couple of, just a couple of slides. I just want to show you some graphs because there are a lot of numbers to talk about. But I'm really happy to, to be talking about this today because I think Kenya provides a really interesting um, case in, in some ways. It provides an example of what not to do, um, but it also provides, I think, some, some good puzzle lessons for, for some of the other countries where NDI is worked. Um, so just a little bit about the political context for those of you who may not be familiar with with Kenya. So uh, they just had elections, as Stephen mentioned, um, March 4th of this year. They were historic in that they were the first elections held since the post-election violence of 2007 and 2008. They were also um, the first election 
elections held after the new constitution, which was passed in 2010. Um, this constitution was extremely ambitious. It was provided for sweeping changes to the entire political system in Kenya. It created, by, uh, among other things, it created a bicameral legislature, created a devolved system of power, creating 47 new counties within Kenya, and expanded Bill of Rights, or limited presidential powers, um, and extensive reforms on election related to election security, land, and um, uh, quite a few other things. It was designed also to begin to address long-standing historical grievances and inequalities, um, including related to the inequalities uh, among women in political participation and participation generally. It was, it's, it's the most progressive constitution in Kenya's history. And in terms of women's political participation, it's quite ambitious, or was, is quite ambitious. Um, I just wanted to, to show you all a number of the affirmative action provisions, some of which are quotas, specific quotas. Um, and this doesn't include all of the provisions included in the constitution. The idea um, of the committee of experts, the technical team that put together the constitution, was to try to embed uh, a number of different principles as well as quotas within the constitution, in part, um, some people believe, to make sure that the quota and the principles could not be legislated away in the implementation process after the constitution was passed. So I just I also bolded just two, two articles related to probably what is, what is the most well-known aspect of the affirmative action provisions in Kenya, uh, the two-thirds gender principle, which I'll, I'll talk about in a minute. And just Article 81 is the principle, and Article 27 is the requirement that it be implemented in the new law. So um, as I mentioned, there's both specific quotas and, and sort of broader principles that were included in the <laughs> Constitution. And um, this is the, the quota numbers, the required uh, parliamentary seats for women. In the Senate, there are 47 <coughs> elected seats. That's one per county. And they're directly elected within each county. There are 16, um, sorry, sorry, uh, let me go back. I thought I was talking about the National Assembly. In the Senate, there are 47 total elected seats, one for each county. So, so there are 16 special seats for women. There's one um, youth, women, female youth seat. Um, as well as a male youth seat, and one special female seat for persons with disabilities. So in total, 18 special seats for women. In the National Assembly, there are 47 special seats for women. Um, these are the, with the special women seats, um, one per county. And then there are 12 party-nominated seats, including for women, youth, and workers. And these are uh, parties who are required to submit uh, lists of, that include included uh, nominees who were part of, who were women, youth, or workers. And just to provide a comparison, in 2002, there were 18 women serving in Parliament out of a total of 209, and in 2007, 22 out of 224. <coughs> so, um, the, now that we've had elections, it's interesting to look to see how much, in terms of numbers, how much impact there's been. Go to the next slide. So I just wanted to show you some graphs. In total, there are 416 um, members of Parliament now, and there are 85 women. Some of these numbers are, are um, changing somewhat depending on, on some of the, um, there's, uh, some people are contesting some of the results still, so. But um, there are 69 appointed seats, and this actually, that's not entirely true because that includes the 47 women special seats. And in total in 2013, 16 um, women were elected outright to, to Parliament. So you go to the next slide. And this just shows the, the breakdown um, between the two houses. So in total, you have now 20% of parliamentary seats held by women. And 33%, if you go to the next slide, 33% um, of women at the county assembly level. So those are just sort of some of the numbers. And um, in terms of the, the process, there this was an extremely challenging process um, throughout. As I mentioned, this, the, the provisions are quite ambitious. And um, during the parliamentary review, review process, for example, before the, the Constitution was brought to referendum, and I know I actually don't have to so, sorry. Um, before the Constitution was brought uh, to referendum, 
um, there was quite a large lobbying effort by women MPs, a women MP, and women civil society organizations which despite the fact that there were a number of efforts internally during this process to take out the gender provisions, um, they were in particular the gender principle, the two-thirds gender principle, um, it remained in the Constitution that was ultimately passed. And let me just um, say something really quick about what the two-thirds gender, gender principle is. It's a requirement that no more than two-thirds of any elected body uh, be comprised of, more than, of, of one gender, so which basically means that at least one third of each elected body needs to be uh, comprised of women. So implementation was mixed at best. It was it was quite quite disappointing to those who were um, promoting the gender principle and were very excited about the under, understandably who were very excited about the um, about how vicious the provisions were in the Constitution. Um, it was a huge uh, gain for women to have those provisions in the Constitution, so it was, a, it was quite disappointing to see what the ultimate results were. But during implementation, um, it was a bit better at the county level, in part because there was a specific formula provided, uh, which stated that you could see the number of seats for, in order to reach the two-thirds gender, gender, or comply with the two-thirds gender principle, um, the number of special seats allocated to women would be determined after the election. So the number of seats would be determined once you know they knew what the, the breakdown was to ensure that the, the county assemblies are um, comprised of at least one third uh, women members. At the national level, um, there was a bill as required by the Constitution that was written in 2011. But it sat, and it sat, and it sat, and it was never debated. And some observers, some people think that there was actually never any intention to bring it up for debate. Um, it was attached to an elections, uh, to a, a bill that was at some point to determine the actual election date, um, which was unlikely to be actually ever debated as well. And it was just, um, many people believe that there was actually no political will to pass this legislation. And what the legislation was supposed to do was to create a formula or, or outline how it was to be implemented. The gender principle was to be implemented at the national level. And so what ended up happening, happening is that the Supreme Court ended up ruling um, disappointingly in December of last year that the gender principle at the national level would need to be implemented um, on, a, at a progressive, on a progressive basis. So essentially now there would need to be 52 more women in the um, parliament by August 2015. So very, very disappointing. Um, obviously, the legal framework is only part of it. Um, and implementation of that legal framework is, is only part of it. I won't, I know I have limited time. So I'll just move on to a couple of other barriers that, important barriers that um, many women in this election um, ran into and, and historically have run into. And it just represents many of the challenges that still need to be overcome to increase women's participation. But you have limited access to media, um, lack of access to financial resources to actually run for office, you have a limited number of women at the top party leadership, which limits the number of women uh, in decision-making roles and potentially the number of women who um, have a voice within the party. There are more frequent targets of electoral violence than their male counterparts. There were quite a, quite a number of disturbing reports out of the 2013 elections about uh, women candidates dropping out of the race because uh, they felt they were being targeted or intimidated um, by violence but, or the threat of violence. <clears throat> in general, their attitudes and societal norms in Kenya are, are still a problem in terms of women's participation. And talking to one of our field staff members, there were they said, well, the most political party, male political party members will say right to your face that there are too many women in parliament already and they just cause trouble. So, and Either. Quite a few challenges. And um, now that we have, uh, there are a number of women uh, elected to at the county level and the national level, there are, you also have the challenges of the fact that many of these women have never served in elected office. And there's a lot of work to be done um, to help them gain the skills that they need and to uh, work together to identify common agendas, to push um, forward certain policies that they agree on. And um, I'm going to stop there. Thank you. 
Yes, it was very frustrating to watch from here that when it passed the Constitution, we were so excited, and then to watch and fade and the hopes go by, and then well, we just don't know how to implement it. We're like, we will show you examples. They've implemented it, but oh, oh yes. Anyway, so now to look from a different viewpoint, from Burkina Faso, where the quota uh, legislation was passed through legislation versus a constitution. And we will hear from Asa Tuberi. Thank you, Susan. Hello, everyone. Thanks for coming. Uh, the Burkina case is um, different because we were very excited when um, uh, the law was passed in 2009. So um, April 16, um, the, the law was passed, and then that was the gender caucus at that time who um, actually initiated the, the bill. But uh, the bill was initiated, but it took uh, 10 years to advocacy for the civil society and a good uh, media contribution. Then the law was passed. Some group parties uh, were uh, opposed to the, the law. Uh, the uh, the smaller ones because they rely on funding, uh, public funding at the time, and they will always argue that they're not not funded by the government. Then uh, for the law itself, it, uh, it's a bit um, big. Um, the article, uh, the article three of the law, says any party or coalition of political party that's a limited list for legislative and local elections would, uh, should definitely include at least 30% of either sex. They don't mention women or or men or gender because they say um, penal constitution does not allow female sexual discrimination. It has to be either um, gender. Can we go to the next slide? Um, but the law actually uh, is, you know, penalties and financial incentives, you know, to encourage uh, parties to um, to abide by the law. For penalty, you know, each party that submits a list with um, uh, with less than thirty percent um, representation would lose fifty percent of public finance for electoral campaign. Then the incentive was. Uh, the party reaches or surpasses the 30% of elected official like um, for the minority sex would actually double their public financing. That was that's a good incentive. But unfortunately, no party was able to do that. Then the language has you know, some witnesses uh, in the law because it's open to several interpretation. It doesn't say where women should be put uh, in the list, and if women should, uh, where, you know, women should be either on the alternate list or the, the primary list. So some people, uh, parties respected the quota law, but they did not actually um, put the women on the primary list. Then um, we didn't know actually if the law was being applied by district or nationwide, because sometimes you can actually respect the law when you pull all the list together and say, oh, we have 30% of women, so be good. But if by district, most of parties didn't uh, respect the law. Then um, for implementation of the law, the law was passed in 2009, and for the first time it was uh, implemented election because in Burkina Faso, uh, presidential election took place in 2010. Then right following the presidential election, um, the uh, local election of the legislative election should have followed in 2011, but it got pushed back until uh, 2012, and then they decided to hold joint election, right, like local and legislative. So it was challenging. And the Ministry of uh, Territorial Administration, you can also say the Ministry of Interior, that's um, in charge of implementing the law, was not even involved when the law was being passed. So the ministry doesn't understand the law. Then um, the guidelines, parties, um, since the 
the law is so open to multiple interpretation, um, the parties needed guidelines um, to, to follow instead of uh, to follow applying the law. Then NDI was uh, working in Burkina Faso with lucky um, women as very lucky because we had a uh, long um, program with uh, participation in national agency. We've been working there for eight years and we've been following the women since uh, the, the beginning. Then uh, NDI was able to support the ministry to come up with those uh, guidelines and we have, you know, got the guidelines published uh, in newspapers and we advertise um, all the parties uh, receive copies of the guidelines um, and we supported a coalition of um, civil society organizations and political parties that we call uh, the Quota Coalition. It's a coalition uh, that's working to uh, monitor uh, the quota implementation. Then NDI uh, assists them in organizing workshops and holding press conferences. Uh, we also translated uh, the law into different local languages. We picked up uh, four main local languages. Uh, and we also uh, printed the law in brochures in those languages and distributed to parties and civil society. Then, um, for the implementation, NDI uh, working with 11 parties, and we help the parties uh, come up with action plans on how to uh, apply the law. And all 11 parties implemented the law. Um, and unfortunately, uh, for the legislative election, uh, only nine out of 11 uh, implemented the law. It's something, but it's still, uh, there is still work to do. That. And then we organized a uh, workshop to uh, inform about the law, and then to even get women um, uh, put in the list, and they had to work and train the women as potential candidates before, like six months before the election, and then train also the actual candidates when uh, they're being uh, in for the election. Then, um, then after the, the elections, uh, our preliminary um, findings, because the the Senate, which is the election commission in Burkina Faso, they're still um, trying to. For the legislature, we know exactly how many women were elected, but at the local level, it's still, um, because they do not start with it by gender, they still don't know. Been uh, several months now because the election took place in December, and we still don't have the final numbers. Uh, but 71 out of 80 parties respected the law. Um, but what we can see here is um, for from 2006 uh, local election to 2012, there was an increase of 125% uh, women in this. So that's a little improvement. Uh, many of them did not get uh, elected, but there was several women. And so then it's on party list. Uh, for legislative, 42 out of 74 parties respect to the law. And that was um, from 2007 legislative to 2012, there was an increase of what? Uh, 337. So, oh, only nine parties got financially sanctioned uh, for not respecting the Buddha law. Um, but we questioned the way the ministry calculated the. Uh, how the ministry calculated um, which party is respected or not, because several parties did not, and why not only nine, only ten are not? It's, it's because they um, selected um, the nationwide basis, they didn't consider by district. So, um, that's so sad. <laughs> then, for the current National Assembly, 24 out of 127 MPs uh, were uh, elected, and 
that's uh, 19 percent, then there's a slight increase of the, uh, from the 15 percent of the previous presentation. And then um, only 15 out of uh, 24 women were directly elected because most of the parties put the women on the alternate list. Because uh, most of uh, in of the countries, uh, especially at the Francophone countries, the uh, the ministries, the former MPs, they all run to, to become MPs because they don't know if there will be what you know uh, ministries again if they will appoint them. So they have to be MPs. So they run and then they win. When the government sits, they say, oh, this ministry, uh, the, the prime minister, for example, was uh, an MP. And then when he got um, nominated again to continue you know, with his prime minister position, then a woman took his place. And then that's when nine other women were able to join the National Assembly. So it's part of the law that when someone leaves that they have to be replaced by a woman? It's not part of the law. Okay. But um, he just happened to. It just happened that the women were on the waiting list uh, for the alternative. Yeah. And then India was able to work with um, 19 women out of the 24 um, directly. And working with them for a while. So they we keep um, continuing to work with them. Then, um, there was, you know, there was no much increase and at the local level we don't know yet because the, uh, the Senate is still working to to start with it by gender um, but it is not with the women uh, where they were supposed to be uh, and in a person has a proportional representation system where only the top will get um, that, that portion for the women. Most of the women got uh, put as third or fourth so that's why uh, they were not uh, very women. There was this um, <coughs> mission, uh, empty mission in, in DC that the Institute of uh, Government Representatives, IRG, they organized uh, missions to Washington, DC for field uh, MPs to come visit. And there was this lady from Pina Paso who is very outgoing and outspoken, and she is. Uh, in the leadership of the ruling party for a very long time, but for the 2012 election, she was put third on the list, and she was so unhappy that she quit the party, and she actually created her own party. So it um, might be a little bit of sometimes. Um, even big parties like the ruling uh, CDP did not uh, respect um, the owner for the list. And uh, moving forward, uh, NDR will continue to work uh, with uh, its partners, especially with the pool of coalition. Then uh, the law itself needs to be strengthened because uh, there's several uh, weaknesses. And uh, we need also an executive order. I don't know if that's the right terminology, because in most of the countries, it's the decret d'application. Last year in June, we organized a forum where Susan and yourself people are uh, part of that forum on doing political participation to, um, to, you know, to improve women political participation, to, you know, to encourage part uh, parties to put women high enough on the list, and then come up with a decree. Because the outcome of that forum was to uh, encourage uh, the government to release that decree or executive order for the implementation of the law, that never happened. Because that order would have uh, changed probably the outcome of the election because some um, women who like put third or after on the list would have been uh, put probably um, second or if they you know use the zebra list or what they call the alternating list, probably more women would have been um, elected. Yeah. And, that, and then that executive law order also would have um, nullified the, the list that did not uh, abide by the law. 
but the Ministry of Territorial Administration only um, they just penalized the parties that did not um, abide by the law, but no list was charged. You know, that's it. Thank you so much. Uh, and even in places where the penalties, like for instance in France, where the penalties are more substantial, some parties are willing to accept the penalty just so that they can keep doing a list that is not tender balance. It's amazing. The, the, uh, the Obviously, politics <coughs> power is involved, but the willingness of people to, to disregard laws in order to, or take the penalties to keep their lists the way they are. Thank you so much. And we're going to go a bit north now to Tunisia and look at a quota that was passed with a little bit more detail in the law's language. It passed very quickly, but uh, we were glad to see it happen, and we'd love to hear the experience in Tunisia. So here, Angela Schwartz, to talk. Uh, thanks. So um, on October 23rd, 2011, Tunisia had a very exciting and historical election. Uh, it was the first election in the Middle East and North Africa following the beginning of the Arab Spring Revolution. Um, so in many ways, Tunisia was really uh, setting a precedent for what was to come in uh, Egypt, Libya, and other countries going through a transition. Um, so Tunisians were voting for a National Constituent Assembly, uh, which was a 217-member body tasked with uh, drafting a constitution. And the, uh, the NCA is, is still in session. They still have not completed the draft of the constitution. Um, okay, so before I get into these... Uh, specific, sorry, the specifics of the quota and the law, I wanted to give you a little bit of background about women's rights in Tunisia. Um, Tunisia has a very long and strong history of supporting women's rights. Um, practically since independence, um, Tunisia has maintained a family code and personal status code that's uh, pretty favorable for women. Um, under legislation, women are given equal access to education, salary, uh, divorce, uh, passing on citizenship to their children. Um, so Tunisia women have long enjoyed these uh, social social uh, rights. Now these did not always translate into politics. Um, before the revolution, women made up about one quarter of the parliament, and um, nearly all of these women represented the ruling party. Um, so while women were present, they weren't really uh, representing women's interests. They were really just there to toe the party line. Um, so now back to the transition. Um, given this long standing of women's rights in Tunisia, it's not really surprising that transitional authorities <coughs> chose to seize the opportunity to try to translate women's social rights into political rights. Um, and a parity law was put into place for the 2011 election meaning that all candidate lists, both from political parties and independent political movements, had to contain equal numbers of men and women. Um, taking that a step further, uh, a zipper system, or a, a zebra system, as Azatou mentioned, was also implemented, meaning that the lists had to alternate. So either man, woman, man, woman, or woman, man, woman, man. Now there were no requirements for uh, how many women had to head lists, so this this did uh, represent a challenge, which I'll get to. Um, so in spite of these, these good intentions with gender parity, as well as the zipper system, um, only 58 women ended up being elected, again, to the 217-member body. So this means about 27% of the NCA is women. Um, and very interestingly, about two-thirds of those women are from the same party. They are from Inata, which is the uh, moderate Islamist party, which is currently in a ruling coalition with um, two secular parties. So overall, Inata won about 40% of the popular vote, um, yet two-thirds of the women represent this party. Um, and this is because for the constituent assembly elections, the um, Tunisian political landscape really just blossomed Prior to the revolution, there were only nine legal parties. After, after the revolution, there were more than 100. Um, and about 81, I believe, of these parties competed in the elections, in addition to a number of um, independent movements and independent candidate lists. Um, yet, all 
only 7% of the total submitted lists contained women at their head. Um, and Anapta, this party who ended up having two-thirds of the women, actually only had uh, one woman head of list. Um, yet, they performed so strongly in comparison to other parties that the women who were second on the list, and in many cases even fourth on the list, uh, ended up with seats in the constituent assembly. While most other parties uh, only won one seat per district, if that, and since most of them had men at the head of list, this meant that for most parties, only men were getting elected. Um, so I guess I will um, I'll kind of wrap up there. Uh, but I think the big picture to keep in mind from Tunisia, and a lesson that Libya certainly learned, and maybe we'll talk about in a moment, is that um, a quota does not necessarily mean that women are going to be elected. Even though 50% of Tunisian candidates were women, that obviously did not mean that 50% of uh, national uh, constituent assembly members were women. Um, so as parties were struggling with internal democracy and really just building their own capacity and the capacity of men and women candidates alike, the quota in a lot of ways um, was actually not a barrier, but a challenge for a lot of parties to be able to prepare equal numbers of men and women candidates. Um, so I think this is what Tunisia hopefully learned. Um, moving forward, uh, Tunisia is planning to have parliamentary and presidential elections later this year, hopefully by December. Um, and uh, we will probably see the parity law again as part of the electoral law. Um, but it's not yet clear if Tunisians will take it a step further and include requirements for head of lists or other mechanisms for actually ensuring that more women are not only candidates but are also elected. Thanks so much. Actually, we saw something very similar in Indonesia as well, where when you have 100 different parties represented and only the first one is there, it does not actually equal the number that was intended for women's participation. But you did a great lead into Libya. Libya came right there, was learning from everything else that was happening, and actually created quite, I believe, uh, a difficult or hard to understand at times um, uh, quota law there. So Megan Dorty is going to speak on the Libyans. Sure, thanks. Um, before I get into the specifics of the, the quota law, I just want to give some background on the, uh, the context of Libyan women, their participation for the revolution. Uh, under the Qaddafi regime, women were largely excluded from politics. Uh, to be fair, this applied to pretty much everyone whose name wasn't Qaddafi. Um, this changed drastically in the February 2011 revolution. Women took on myriad roles. They were couriers, they carried ammunition and arms to the front lines. They organized, uh, they lobbied internationally for political support. They were really active and really visible. Unfortunately, after the revolution, this disappeared a little bit. Uh, men were generally grateful for the roles that the women had played, but wanted to thank them and have them return inside and uh, you know, let the men get on with the serious work of nation building. So all of these incredible changes that were happening in Libya, the creation of new governing institutions, the formation of political parties, all of this was happening, but it was largely taking place without input from women. There were two women who were appointed to the interim governing body, the National Transitional Council, or the NTC. Uh, two women were appointed to the transitional cabinet, and this led many leading women's activists to joke that the unofficial quota uh, for women in Libya is two. Uh, similarly, political parties were formed mostly by men, dominated by men. They would talk about the importance of women's participation, but rarely follow through. And if you'll allow me a quick aside, I'll just share this one anecdote. Um, I, I can't tell you how many times I was working with political parties who, where I would be the only woman in the room. And one time, I, I challenged a party. I said, you know what? Next time you come back, I want you to bring some women. And they did. And I was phenomenally impressed. They showed up with 10 women. And I was really thrilled until the coffee break when I talked to these women and realized that they had been pulled in off the street because the party was too embarrassed <laughs> to admit that they didn't have any women members. Uh, so with this background in mind. So did they stay? <laughs> they stayed. <laughs> but I hope they were going to stay. Background in mind, we can take a little bit of a look at 
the election. In January of uh, last year, the NTC election committee released a draft law for public comment. Um, it established a majoritarian election system and pretty much ignored political parties, um, and it said that there would be a 10% quota for women. Unfortunately, that was all it said. There was literally no information on how that quota would be implemented. Almost immediately, the election law was protested by pretty much everyone. Uh, political parties were furious that they were not included, and women's activists uh, were livid about this quota. I think in the first couple of days, there were about 13,000 uh, comments on the election committee's Facebook page. And many of them were about this quota. Women were upset that it was 10%. Some of them wanted it to be increased to 30. Others uh, misunderstood the wording and thought it was imposing a 10% maximum, which in Libya's conservative climate would not actually be out of the realm of possibility. Uh, and then still other women didn't understand the purpose or the intent of the quota. And so they said, this is an insult to us. We are just as good as the men. We want to compete on equal footing. So after all of this uproar, the law was revised. And there are many changes, but the one that is the most relevant for us to talk about is that whereas there were no political parties mentioned in the first law, the revised law said of the 200 seats, 80 are going to be for political party lists and 120 for uh, independent candidates. Uh, and moreover, what we were discussing earlier, they adopted a pretty progressive system. Uh, it's a, called a closed list, horizontal, and uh, vertical system, or a zebra system, or a butterfly system. There are lots of potential words that we can call it. But what it means is that political parties were required to alternate gender on their list, so man, woman, man, woman, or woman, man, woman, man, but also that half of their lists had to have women in the number one slot. Um, and so in adopting this approach, they were trying to learn from the experience of, of Tunisia. I think it's important to point out, though, that that quota only applied to those 80 seats. There were no similar requirements for the 120 uh, independent seats. There were, there were some problems with the quota. Some of the smaller conservative parties only put women at the top of their lists in districts where they already expected to do pretty poorly. And um, anecdotal evidence suggests that some of the more creative uh, conservative parties changed their name in every district just a little bit, uh, so that they never had to put a woman at the top of any of their lists. I mean, you have to commend them. They changed the party name? They changed the party name. Yeah. So if it was the you know, Wellness and Justice Party in another district, it would be the Justice and Wellness Party. Um, yes. I know, right? Uh, I do want to be clear, though, that those anecdotes are really the exception. By and large, most parties did comply uh, <coughs> with these regulations. And it was this fascinating paradigm shift because suddenly these women who had been pretty much ignored by political parties were being actively recruited as candidates. And while the, this proactive recruitment of candidates was really exciting to watch, there were still some issues. Um, very few of the women realized that they had any negotiating power, um, or that they had any leverage, and that they could negotiate their placement on the list. And I, mean, I knew women candidates who, maybe even a week or two out from the election, didn't actually know where they were on the list. Um, so there was not a lot of information um, going around about the power that women had to negotiate. But jumping ahead and taking a look at the election results, 33 women were elected. Of those 33 women, 32, so 97% were elected on the party list system. One woman was successful as an independent. Um, I, mean, I think the math speaks for itself. <laughs> it's, it's pretty clear that, the, that this horizontal and vertical differing system really did make a difference. Not only did most of the women candidates choose to compete on the party lists, um, I, I looked at the results and most of the independent women, other than the one who won, are all cluttered towards the bottom and did very poorly. Um, so while it's clear that the, the quota made a big difference, I'll, I'll just close by saying that we can't exactly consider this a, a case closed. There is still a very long road ahead. The, um, the women MPs, you know, similarly to some of the examples we were discussing earlier, are very inexperienced and need a lot of support. They're fighting an uphill battle. 
there's an upcoming constitutional process, women will need to provide input and be involved. And there is ongoing backsliding and uh, persistent cultural resistance to women in prominent leadership roles. So while the quota played a decisive role in guaranteeing that women are at the table, there's, there's still a long role in Thank you so much for that. And so I think that's a nice jump, actually, to Kosovo, where, um, like some of the other examples, there was a big parity law in the Constitution. And now there has been time. There have been several elections, and we've seen how things um, evened out there. So Anna, I will pass. Oh, come on. That would be great. Okay. Uh, please go and talk about this. Great. Thank you, Susan. Um, Kosovo is celebrating its 12-year quota anniversary, actually. So we are quite a ways away from when it was first introduced. But before I get into the quota, um, I'd like to give you just some background and context for those who aren't familiar with Kosovo politics. Um, following the war with Serbia in 1999, Kosovo entered a period of international supervision. Um, it gained full independence in 2008, and in 2012, it formally ended supervised independence. So the international community was very prominent and, prominent and played quite an influential role over the past several years. Um, as Europe's youngest democracy, it's really striving to become a regional leader in women's empowerment. Um, a number of women hold prominent positions, including president, two deputy prime ministers, and the chair of the Central Election Commission. Um, the country's legal framework enshrines gender equality through the Constitution and a number of laws, including the law on gender equality, as well as law on the general and local elections. The law on the general and local elections require that at least 30% of each political party's entity list be made up of uh, members of the minority gender. Today, 40 out of 120 members of parliament are women thanks in part to the gender quota. So to go back to 2001 and how the quota was first introduced, it was introduced by the International, in fact, it was introduced following the 2000 municipal elections, which were the first elections to take place following the conference in Serbia, when it became very clear that the underrepresentation of women was going to become a problem. So the United Nations Interim Administration Mission in Kosovo introduced the quota through the constitutional framework. Um, so for the elections that took place between 2001 and 2004, they took place with the quota. And when people went to vote, they would select for one party, and then it, they would select one party, and then it was up to that party to allocate 30% of the seats won to women. Um, this was respected. It was verified by the Central Elections Commission, again, due in part to the influence of the international community. They didn't quite have a choice. Um, in 2007, the electoral system was revised. So civil society had complained that the way the party selected the list and put allocated the seats was unjust and unfair. So they decided to open those lists. So starting in 2007, when voters went to vote, they would select a party and then would be able to select any number of candidates. The regulation, um, the regulation changed then to reflect this electoral system change so that Every party's list had to, to, every third person on the party list had to be one. And in order to ensure that 30% of the assembly or the local assembly would be made up of women, the, if the party didn't achieve the 30% quota by the time the election was done, the, the man on the, on the bottom of the list would be replaced by the next qualified person of the minority gender, so by a woman, until the 30% was achieved. Um, following the 2010 uh, parliamentary elections, this system came out of fire, came under fire because a lot of people argued that it was unfair to replace a man who had just won that seat with a woman because of the quota. Um, Again, the international community was the one to raise this, this, this issue, and interestingly, since 2007, none of the 20-something men that have been replaced in favor of a woman have complained. Um, and this locally was such a, a hot issue that both women and civil society decided to rally together and preserve both the quota and the open system in that state. Um, 
In terms of how successful the quota has been, if you're looking at numbers, um, as I mentioned before, women on the national level hold 40 seats out of 120. That's 33.3% with all of those women um, securing seats based on merit and based on votes in the rest of the quota. On the local level, level women hold more than 30% of the seats in some of the, or more than 30% of the seats in some of the municipal assemblies. And this has allowed women to form cross-party caucuses, both at the national and on the local levels, that has allowed them to work together on various policies, ensuring that the law on gender equality, for example, is being implemented and being respected, that there's quite, um, quite a bit of, of quite a bit to go. Um, in terms of challenges that women are currently facing, and a lot of the speakers have mentioned this before, uh, chief among them is the lack of democracy within political parties. So the way that the women are selected to become part of the candidate list is not very transparent. It's essentially three men in a room going, she's pretty, she's popular, she's rich, but they're on the list. And it's not so much based on what women have done to earn that spot on the list. It's on the list, so that continues to be a problem. Um, women also have a lack of resources. Uh, the political parties receive campaign funds, but the law does not determine how those funds should be allocated. So parties end up providing funds to the key players who are essentially always men. Um, there is still a bit of a quantity versus quality debate, with people believing that if women are elected because of the quota, they are just there, not because they earned it. Yeah, they're not going to do much more to get um, into the subway. Um, and there is still poor representation at the local level. So out of the 37 municipalities, there are no women mayors and only two deputy mayors. So while the quota has been successful and necessary in the time being to uh, secure women's representation at both the national and local level, there are certainly uh, several steps that need to be taken to make sure that it's fully functional. Thank you so much. Well, I have many questions, but I will turn it over and we will take some from the audience and thoughts or questions that you might have. Yes. First of all, Michelle Beckering from IRI. This was a great presentation. Um, and I, like Susan, work in the full time as well on women's issues. And what plays a big part into a, a, how a lot of women are getting elected? I, and maybe I missed it, but I heard um, as a two, you were talking about the penalty in Burkina Faso, and I think this is something we talk about a lot. Quotas are only as good as sort of the penalties or uh, the advantages um, parties get if they actually use them. Are there any other best practices from your countries of uh, really good mechanisms to either penalize or uh, maybe on the other side, this, you know, the carrot side actually? Um, you know, give an advantage to parties? Because I think that's a hard thing we find across the world. There's there's not really good data on what's the best way to actually implement these or enforce them. So I was just curious if you have other good examples. Sure. I wish the answer to that question is yes. Um, I was hoping you knew, but um, I don't. So. Um, unfortunately, in Libya, at least there are no incentives but the penalty for non-compliance, if your list does not, um, you know, if it doesn't fulfill the quota requirements, your list can't go forward. It gets thrown out, which I think is pretty powerful incentive. Yeah, it, similarly in Tunisia, there were no uh, financial penalties or, um, or anything like that. Uh, it was just if the list did not fulfill the 50% gender parity requirement, it, was not allowed to move forward. Um, but I don't think, in Tunisia at least, that wasn't really, really a problem, again, just because there's this very strong tradition of people supporting women's rights. Um, so at least I didn't really hear of any cases in Tunisia where a party was, was trying to um, kind of get around the parity requirement. For working on class, we know we have to invite it. We have, um, Penalty, but it didn't prevent um, some parties, uh, you know, not to fight by the law. The, um, for me, it's the uh, the political will. Like when political parties and everyone is willing to um, promote women and see women 
in a like equal than with men, then this can happen. Because in some countries, um, for example, in Senegal, they have a very law, but um, even like fifty percent of the national assembly is not um, is not you know women, but um, it's just the way. Um, you know, those patriarchy society, we're coming from far away, people just need, um, and parts, especially parties, they just need to be willing to accept that women are qualified enough and they're capable of the work. Then it's going to happen. Otherwise, um, like Susan said before, in France, some parties are willing to pay, you know, to even pay for penalties to be able um, not to present, you know, women on the list. And in Burkina Faso, the ruling party would be advocated so much for the law, but for the legislative election, the ruling party did not uh, uh, respect the law. So it's just uh, a matter of work. Certainly the elections um, commissions or whatever, the election management body can play such a strong role if they are willing to throw out the list and not just look the other way. Um, it's not just the legislature or the parties, but all the parts of the election. Did you want to add something else? I was just going to say, that's actually a perfect um, segue into I was just going to, you know, the, the quotas and the affirmative action provisions are very confusing, so there aren't very many examples. But in terms of the election commission, one thing they can do is enforce the rules. So for the special women seats um, in particular, the parties were supposed to, just as an example, they were supposed to submit lists um, sort of this list, so alternating lists, and many of them just went ahead and submitted lists with um, six men at the top, six men, six women at the bottom, and the election commission, instead of accepting the list, came back to the parties and said, we're not going to accept the list unless you um, revise your list. So, um, yes? Yeah, I think it's interesting, I think in all these countries, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, in all these countries, like, so especially in Kenya and Virginia, have specified one third of either gender, um, and just a binary conception. Uh, and I wonder if in any of these countries, um, there's conversation about transgender identities, uh, and also for IDI, uh, how are we helping our partners, or are we helping our partners conceive like, diversity, uh, not just in a binary traditional concept, but in terms of diversity is a valuable, and is it, the transgender community is, becoming, is growing, but it's becoming more open in many countries, how uh, that conversation happens. Did anyone on it for these discussions that we knew of in any of these countries? No, absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> not Libya? Um, it is interesting, though, that the gender neutral um, language is the most common now. It doesn't say 30% women, but it's of the lesser gender. We have yet come to the point where we had to use a quota to make sure men are represented in these elective bodies. Um, but certainly, I think the area of, of working with transgender is a new area, just because in many of the countries where NDI works, the, the society isn't there to have those conversations, and especially in, in newly elected countries that are coming out of a much more conservative place, we haven't been there. Um, I did, uh, we, there has been talk um, with the citizen participation team and working with um, groups in civil society who are looking at these issues. I think that's most of the work that we've done is through um, citizen participation and organizing through civil society. So, sorry, that doesn't really answer, but it's as much as I know. Uh, yes, Layla. Um, I'm Layla Makari. Uh, thank you so much, NDI, for organizing this panel. I learned a lot about quotas, but thank you. Uh, I'm curious about uh, commissions on the status of women. Um, I'm curious if these help in any way to get women elected, and have you seen in your work uh, that commissions on the status of women uh, play a role in helping to get, a, helping to get women uh, elected? Are you referring specifically to a ministry within the government or on an independent group that, that monitors women's participation in the country? Or? Um, sure, uh, ministry commissions or, um, you know, I guess I'm also interested in how civil society, women's, uh, women's rights groups uh, help in this, in this respect. Do we have any strong examples? Uh, I know the ministry in Burkina Faso was mm -hmm. instrumental in yeah, and the, uh, the the coalition, the Kuro coalition, um, that comprises um, eight civil society organizations, 
and three um, occupiers that petitioned in the ruling party, they um, advocated a lot for um, parties to put women high enough under this. It didn't work as um, what people <coughs> expected, but they did quite a um, good job um, for that. And they're advocating also for the executive order that, you know, um, allow the ministry or the Senate to reject the list when parties are not uh, in compliance with the Sorry, quick question. Did any of you have any particularly strong male allies or champions who helped in the passage or implementation of the law, or was it largely women's organizations or leaders or activists? I'll just say, similar to the Kosovo example, actually the most ardent champion for the quota in Libya's case was the international community. It was really the UN's influence um, instead of a global pro-Russian environment. Um, in, in Tunisia, again, men were were quite supportive in general of the of the gender parity uh, part of the electoral law, um, and in fact, kind of going beyond gender, also looking at secular versus Islamist parties. The Islamists were also quite supportive of gender parity in Tunisia, which was interesting. I thought. Can I make uh, to follow on that point? I guess one of my one of the things I've seen, and I'd just be curious if anybody has a comment. I think what I clearly saw in Kenya and other countries is it really, the, the framing of the quotas took on very much, it wasn't a win-win situation at all. It was men lose, women gain. And so when you set up that kind of, uh, I guess, conflictive dynamic, there are winners and there are losers. So I guess if you would comment on that. The other issue, I guess to be blunt, quotas are important, make no mistake. Here's what keeps me awake at night, though. That even when women are elected, it's not changing the power dynamics at all. That they're filling these seats that are, that's the woman's seat, now the real seats are over here. So I don't necessarily have an answer, I'm working on it, but uh, I guess I'd be curious to hear kind of how, what you think about that as well, what you're seeing in your respective countries. I can certainly speak from a more global point of view that we certainly try to frame when we're talking about quotas with political party leaders in that it is a win-win situation. We don't advocate for it because within our certain percentage of the population it's the right thing to do, but that it will actually make their political party stronger, both in how they reach out to voters, in the issues that they're advocating for, and the way they'll be representative. So we do try to make it more of a of a win-win when we're um, working with political party leaders. And, but I also think that we struggle with, with the impact of them. NDI works with parties across the political spectrum, so the women that are sometimes elected in these conservative countries are very conservative and will vote to take away some of the women's rights that we would hope to build on in these countries. So that's definitely something that, that we think about. We're also trying to do a better measure, do a better job of measuring women's impact. Are the legislative priorities or the legislative agenda is different um, when women are elected? Is the budget different in any way? How money is spent? In some OECD countries, they've done a good job of measuring that, but they have a lot more information to collect and they've been doing it for a longer amount of time. But certainly, I not only NDI, but groups that we're involved with with IDO politics, whether it's um, International IDEA or UN Women, are also trying to find a way to measure um, the impact long term. Any other issues? Yeah. I can perhaps add some information on Senegal. I was just there recently. Um, the gender quota, the parity quota was passed. I think it was 48% that were elected. And, and to Asenko's point, it was very much linked to political will. It was seen as being competitive to, to have women on the list. And, but what that meant was that many women got elected who had never served before. Many of them can't read or write. Some only speak Wolof. Some don't even speak Wolof or French. So it, it's a challenge. And but what has happened is that the women uh, MPs have have uh, reached out to civil society organizations like um, the Association of Women Jurists and have um, 
have reached some informal agreements so that, that these groups come in and train these women on specific issues when the law comes up so that they can be prepared. And, uh, and there, there are some women who served before who are very good at organizing the new women who came in so that it becomes sort of a, a badge of honor to be there long hours to demonstrate that women are active. There was a male MP who made the comment that maybe in the evening you only see fula, you only see headscarves <laughs> walking the, the aisles because uh, the men have gone home. But the women are still there. Well, Mike's everywhere. Um, my question really was in building on Egypt's example, which had a quota under the old regime, and women now reject the quota because it's representative of Suzanne Mubarak and the old way of doing things. It was perceived as just a way to, to lock in hegemony by the ruling party. Are there, are there anecdotes of these women working together on uh, legislative issues, you know, are there, um, and is there, are there recommendations for what it could be called other than a quota to help women come together? Women might all agree in Egypt there should be more women in parliament, but the idea of working together for something called a quota is the one thing they agree they won't do. I would say, unfortunately, Tunisia is currently proving to be sort of the antithesis of this. Um, women are not at all working together. Um, in fact, uh, the political environment uh, since the 2000 elections in Tunisia has become very divisive, whereas before there was a lot of consensus building. Now, I mean, everyone's identity is party first. So there's no women's caucus. There's no cross-party efforts for women, uh, unfortunately. Doesn't really answer your question, but, uh, but certainly uh, in Kosovo, they fought, they fought together to, to beat back the quota. There's been a strong women's caucus that was formed. They did, yeah. Um, Kosovo has a pretty good example of uh, cross-party caucus working together on any number of legislative uh, issues. Um, in 2010, when the quota came under fire, they were very outspoken. They were in the media constantly. They went to Brussels, they advocated, and they just pushed back and pushed back and pushed back until the issue was completely taken off the table when they were talking about electoral reform in 2011. Um, right now, they're just starting to, there's a little bit of a disconnect between women on the national level and women on the local level. Um, and we're seeing that there is a bit of a hesitance to admit that um, parties aren't very democratic on the local level. So, women from the national level are now, are now starting to reach out to their party branches and say, so, and ask them about women's organization at the, at the local level. And all the women at the local level go, so it's fine, it's great, and the women at the national level goes, really? Well, I have, like, who's your party president? I mean, we're, there's no woman party president. We're not equally represented. And then they start talking about how to improve this, I think, the link between the parties for the branch and headquarters and improve women's representation throughout. But that's just sort of so the other phrase uses temporary special measure, but it doesn't roll off the tongue. Yeah, in Arabic, that's <laughs> So we are about 15 minutes over, and I hate to keep people past there, the time that we said. Um, obviously, we are all around if you have future questions, and you can always email us at the Women's Political Participation Team, all of the members that are here. Uh, Caroline Hubbard is here. Did Susan Kemp step out? And uh, Rebecca is here. And is Gina still here? There you are, Rebecca. So we're all around. We have plenty of materials outside. We're here to help and put you in contact. Um, even though we collect a lot of the examples here and gather the information, we, we can also put you in touch with folks like this who have lived through it very recently and can help um, hopefully avoid some of the pitfalls and make these laws um, stronger as we go forward. So thank you for your participation today. Appreciate you coming.